so much for joining me today. I was just rereading this amazing book, Green Lights by Matthew McConaughey. Don't know if you've had a chance to read it yet, but it is a real treat. The storytelling, life lessons, it's just super, super inspiring. And you know what's even more of a treat? And I know it's the reason that you're here with me today, is that we actually have the amazing author, Academy Award winning actor, producer, professor, philanthropist, minister of culture, father, husband, storyteller, self-proclaimed pickle expert, and all around amazing human being, Matthew McConaughey here with us today. Now I know maybe over the years you've spent time with him as Wooderson in Dazed and Confused, or as Rust Cole in True Detective, or maybe it was with Ben in How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, or as in Ron Woodruff in the Dallas Buyers Club. But today, we actually get to spend time with him in his best role ever, himself. And we'll get to hear so much more about his amazing book. I am so excited to welcome you to today's special Lift Up speaker series. I'm Rochelle Diamond. I'm on our employee experience team, and I'm just so honored to get to run our LinkedIn speaker series with the goal of bringing in inspiring ideas and diverse, innovative thinkers to make you more productive and successful. And with today's event, I really feel like we just hit that nail on the head. And to make this event even awesomer, if that is a word, we have our amazing VP of Employee Experience and our queen of the Lift Up program, Nina McQueen, here as our hostess with the mostess for this exciting event. Now, before we begin, just a few things to note. LinkedIn employees, you can get a free copy of the audio or ebook version of Green Lights at Go Slash Speaker Series, it's first come, first serve. Also, I wanna give a big shout out and thank you to Chris Packard on our media productions team for the idea, the initial idea to bring in Matthew McConaughey. And then I also wanna thank the 100 employees who submitted questions for Matthew. Unfortunately, we can't get to all of them, but we were able to select a handful and we'll get to hear from those lucky employees later in the event. And we won't be taking additional questions during this event. And finally, some good news. This event was supposed to be 45 minutes, but we're extending it to an hour. So hopefully you'll be able to stay with us the whole time. So now, all right, all right, all right. You know I had to do it, right? <laughs> it's that time to put your hands together for a warm round of applause, virtual welcome to our amazing guest, Matthew McConaughey and Nina McQueen. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Rochelle. That was a perfect intro. And hey, Matthew, yeah, we have you, almost- Yeah, I agree. I think if we I have like make, over- maybe take Rochelle on the road with that intro. I, 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 that works for me. And thanks for getting Pickle Expert in there. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Rochelle. She's How an amazing- doing, I'm doing really well. And you should know, we have over 2,500 people on this call already. They're still joining from around the world, Bangalore, Toronto, uh, Paris, it's been incredible. Everyone's jumping on, so excited. And I wanted, I wanted to add a couple things to what Rochelle said. Matthew is also the creative director for Wild Turkey and has co-created his own bourbon called Long Branch. He's the founder and CEO of the Just Keep Living Foundation, and most recently, New York Times number one best-selling author for his book Green Lights. And I might add that I feel he's a bit of a Renaissance man. So. Again, hi, Matthew, and welcome to LinkedIn. We are very happy to have you here. Good to see you, Nina, and good to be here. And hello to everyone out there around the world. Let's have a great time. Nice. Hey, so first of all, I just want to ask, how are you? How are you doing and how's the family doing? Um, my answer to that is relatively I'm doing very well. Um, and what I mean why I say that word relatively, why I put that before doing very well is that I'm in a privileged position that, you know, when the pandemic hit uh, mm -hmm. and we decided to quarantine, we were able to go get my mother out of retirement community and bring her into our house. I was able to say, OK, um, I'm going to work from home because I have the ability to work from home. My pantry's full. Uh, we're able to get these kids, you know, my kids have laptops so they can go online and do remote schooling. That's why I say relatively well, because a lot of people don't have 
those things uh, through this last tough year that I've had. So relatively, I'm doing very, very well. Um, we got uh, my mom got the uh, her first dose of a vaccination the other day. She's 89, so she was up at, up at the front line after the front line workers. Um, and here we are just strolling into to 2021, carrying I some know. of last year into it and looking to turn some pages. That's right, that's right. My mother also got the vaccine and I'm very happy about that. So we it's are gonna start a stress off- It's a buster, isn't it? I was so relieved. I, I mean, I was woohooing all over the place when I found out she just got it Monday. Um, so we're going to do a little speed round to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, just about seven questions. And we're going to start off with a pretty easy one. Since we're on a Zoom call right now, soft pants or hard pants? Soft. <laughs> ditto. Ditto. What is one <laughs> object from your childhood that you could never throw away? One object from my childhood that I could never throw away. Oh, I had this, uh, I had one stuffed animal and her name was Sweetie. And she, I think she was a frog, but it was one of those things where it was just basically four legs and she was green and yellow and had two eyes. But that was the one It had the right kind of size bean, granular bean, or beans inside of it. And I slept yeah. with it. It went everywhere. It had many holes. I sewed that thing and patched that thing up probably 25, 30 times. Um, yeah, and his name was Sweetie. Ah, oh, sweetie. Okay, so what is one thing you have to have in your fridge at all times? Pickles. Of course. <laughs> of course. And today, as we mentioned, is Dream Big In Day for all of us here at LinkedIn. So what is your favorite place to dream big or to think big or to come up with ideas? I'm, you know... I'm a man who lives on the road. Our family travels a lot. Um, mm -hmm. I do have certain places that I feel more creatively turned on than others. But, you know, if my, if inspiration comes to me, I take a lot of honor of being able to have it if I'm, you know, locked up in a dark closet alone, <laughs> you know, with no view at all. Um, I appreciate solitude and I've, and I've, and I've been able to be very creative with in, in, in solitude, like the book 50 day, 52 days, right in the book. That was mainly me off in a cabin in the middle of the desert without electricity. I found that to be creative because I was forced to, you know, spend time with myself, but also I can, you know, if I've, I've found creativity on at the top of mountains. I've found it on, on walkabouts, on hikes, on overlooking uh, great vistas and horizons. Um, I'm kind of 24 seven, the early morning, 4.30 a.m. till about 6 a.m. is my probably my most creative time. And I think it's because I've gotten some rest and the world is still turned off. The world is still quiet. Um, yes. and, and wake up at 4.30 and do not check in on emails. Do not check in on where the world asked, came to me through the night. Do not go online and see what the news is sit there and that would be my favorite cup of tea or coffee creative time right then and that is such a healthy thing to do is not to just immediately grab our phones check our email and get engaged while we're still just coming to so i think that's great advice okay here's it's, the next it's one it's hard to do too you know it's hard to do too but yeah I, I say this all the time if we can remember check in with yourself before you check in with the world it's it's a it's a it's a good good practice okay so i've heard like me you like thrillers what is your favorite thriller movie? Favorite thriller movie? Um, you know what I just saw the other day? I didn't watch it again, but it came on TV. And I was reminded how much I enjoyed doing it, actually. It was Lincoln Lawyer. Uh, that movie oh. really stands up. Um, that's a really good one. I would say, you know, another thrilling movie that people may not call a proverbial thriller. Um would be Beast of the Southern Wild. Thrilling movie. Hmm. Love that. It's actually more of a love story. Now, you know what's thrilling to me right now? Watch what? Queen's Gambit. Oh, Queen's great Gambit. movie. Yes. We're back playing chess. We're back playing. Really, really, really well done. Scott Frank, the director. The girl that's uh, at, at, at 17 years old mm -hmm. is wonderful. 
interesting actress. I'm not sure who it is. I haven't looked yet, but boy, it's 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 really really fun. So after the kids go to bed, Mom and Camilla and I, that's what we're checking out right now. Yeah, yeah, I watched that. It was amazing. So my, if I go back in all time, my favorite thriller movie is Jagged Edge. Do you remember that one? That was Jeff Bridges oh, and Glenn Close. Oh, I remember Jagged Edge. Well, hey, let me go. Okay. On on that sort of note, let me go back. Do you remember Angel Heart? Oh yes. Yes. Mickey Rourke, Lisa Bonet, Mickey Rourke's been an investigator in his own life, Robert De Niro. That was always one of my favorite. I had that poster on my wall as a kid. Very sexy <laughs> film, too. Okay, next question. Can you describe for us the taste of bourbon that is over 100 years old and that was bottled before Prohibition? Well, Jimmy Russell, the Buddha of bourbon. Um... I was in his office, Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, and uh, we would been hanging out all day long, trying different bourbons. And then he goes, well, you want to tell you something really special? And he pulled a little bottle out that he's had and it was since before Prohibition and took a sip. I was surprised that it still had so much taste, that it still had a, still a nice big hit on the back end. But it had, you could tell it had the years on it. And I think the years were, if you drink bourbon, you know, you have a first quarter, a sec first quarter when it first goes in the mouth, second it goes up to the top of the roof of the mouth, and third it goes down. Wild turkey's always got that good finish that lets you know it's wild turkey when it goes down. Um, a hotter finish uh, than, than most bourbons. Um, but the, the entrance, the first sip, where it first came in and where it went to the roof of the mouth, you could tell it had years under it. It was not in a rush, and I was not in a rush to swallow it either because I knew I could only have one sip. It was it was beautiful. Oh, sip. That was such a treat. That is just such a special thing he shared with you. Okay, mm -hmm. so last question, last one of the speed round. What do you suppose? How do you suppose life turned out for David Wooderson, your character in Dazed and Confused? How do you, how oh, do you think things? Turned you know, I've often thought about that. I think, um, I think he got. Married and had triplets, <laughs> and he and he has a uh, he's a wonderful father with three, probably redheaded triplet girls. I think girls. they were triplet I girls. Girl, he had three redheaded triplet girls, and he um, he lives modestly but responsibly, and hold and has his own community radio station where he is the full time DJ from his house, sitting in a room like I'm sitting in right now. With and I bet he's still going like to see Smith. And he's still, I, at least I hope now he I don't think he's, I hope, you hope he's still going back to high school? No, no, I hope he's, I hope that he is still seeing Aerosmith. I mean, he'd be about oh, 60. Oh, hell yeah. No, he's still he's rocking. He, yeah, he's rocking oh, he's, it. No, he's still, he's still rocking on the front row. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so like, like, Probably almost everyone on this call. We first met you in Days and Confused when you turned that walk-in part into the absolute breakout role of the movie. But I'm curious, what's your relationship with All Right, All Right, All Right? I have a very good relationship, a wonderful relationship with All Right, All Right, All Right. Now, I get asked all the time, hey, are you tired of it? Because it precedes me. People say it. It's tat People get tattoos of it in very interesting places on their body, I might say, as well. It's on T-shirts. It's on banners. I see it around. It's been, it's stolen, used. It's it's said all the time. People say it to me before I they even know I'm showing up. So when I'm asked, "Are you tired of that?" I'm the honest answer is absolutely not. And I'll tell you why. It's the first three words I ever said on screen. In the summer of 1992 in Austin, Texas, I walk into the right bar, the right time, meet a casting director, go read for a small part with three lines, get cast in this movie, and I show up on a set one night and I'm not even supposed to work. I get invited into a scene, and those are the first three words I say out of my mouth, improvised. So when I'm on the set that night, my very first night on a, on a set, on a film set, 1992, I don't know. Is this my one time? Is this my one night? Is, is, is this my one job where I'm going to look back later in my life and go, oh, I remember that summer in 92 where I got that acting job. That was a hobby. That was really fun. I didn't know. Well, the first three words I said on a set turned out to be the beginning of 20, what, eight, nine years later, turned out to a career that I love. So Aww. that's why. I, I, I really uh, like and I'm honored when I hear it. The first three words you said, McConaughey, on screen, 
now still precedes you 29 years later where you found something more than a hobby? You found a career that you love to do? All right. Pretty special. So there's one other role I want to ask you about, which is I'm a huge John Grisham fan. I still remember the day yeah. I saw Time to Kill in the theater opening weekend. And towards the end of the film, your character, Jake Brigance, delivers his closing argument. And you could have heard a pin drop in that crowded theater. And to this day, whenever I you know, catch that scene, my eyes well up and I can't catch my yeah. breath. And right now I'm reading A Time for Mercy. So my question is, yeah. is there any chance you might revisit that now that he says he'd like to make it into a movie? Well, we've talked about that, and I'm and I'm in, I'm serious considering that, um, and we're in discussions now about the right way to develop that. You know, I'm not. Uh, I I've done quite a few films with like, hey, do you want to come back and reprise the role? We've talked about that with True Detective. We've talked about it with Lincoln Lawyer. We've talked about it with other films. Um, and I was like, nah, I don't know about to go doing a sequel. I did that. You know, we talked about it with Magic Mike. Talked about do you want to do a sequel? I passed on that. I was like, no, that character mm -hmm. that I created. And the original lives on. That's that. That's it's a one-off. I don't want to follow it up. Well, time to kill. After time to, for mercy came out, I'm looking at it and I'm going, boy, the the the, the values of Jake Brigance that I personally align mm -hmm. with, the Americana of it, the timing of going, boy, if if I've I've done, it's I'm far enough away. Time to kill is 1996, so you want a mm -hmm. certain amount of distance. You know, years between doing a sequel, at least I do. If you if you if you do a sequel right on top of your first one in success, I don't think there's enough time for the novelty or the originality. Some usually, and if you wait too long, it's almost kind of forgotten. I think right now, in the next ten years, could be a sweet spot for me returning to a role like Jake Brigant's in another story like A Time for Mercy. I also think that it's very uh, Americana. You know, when I talk mm -hmm. about the, the the values that I'm aligned with, so. And it's a great, and talk about thrillers, as you brought up earlier, it is a great thriller. So we're, we're talking about that, that now. The book's got a lot of assets, and then you have to go, okay, what, how does this book transfer to a two-hour film? Or a series, maybe. Maybe a limited series. Um, wow. But we are in discussions about that, so it's possible. I'm thrilled to hear that. So let's let's talk a little bit more about the book, Green Lights. You take us on this journey through your life and the lessons you learned along the way, and it's really told so beautifully. I can see how much words matter. And I love how you play with words, how you contemplate them and dissect them. And, and for those of you listening on the call right now, I know many of you either will or have read the book. But if you can, you've got to get the audio version because Matthew reads it aloud. <laughs> and, and something I didn't pick up when I was reading the book, but when I heard you in the audio version of the book, it's like poetry. I, the way that you speak it, I had to go back to the book again and realize that I wasn't reading it that way. And when you hear yourself speak it, it mm. is poetry. So how'd you come up with Green Lights? Well, thank Lights? you. And, and explain to everybody, like, what does yeah. this mean to you? Okay. So the book is based off of 36 years of journals that I've kept. I've been keeping the journals since I was 14, so 37 years now. But the book is based off of 36. Um I finally got the courage to go away and see, I had a big treasure chest. I still have a big treasure chest full of these journals. And I finally got the courage to go away and see what the hell they were. Could I find a central theme in them? What, who, who, how much am I thinking about today? The same stuff I was thinking about at 14. How much of the way I see the world today, has it evolved from, from when I was 14? What are the consistent themes that my mind and heart have been working on and naturally that I've been putting in journals all my life? Um, I went away and what I found were seven categories. Um, mm -hmm. There was a big stack, a lot of stories about people, a lot of story about story about a lot of stories about places. Uh, there were people, places. Uh, there were uh, prescribes. There were poems. There were prayers. Uh, there were bumper stickers, um, and then there were a lot of stories of my life. And when I had all those stacks lined up those categories, I said, well, now let me sift through those and see if I can find a central theme. The central theme that came out of those was hence the title Green Lights. I noticed through my life that there were ways that I had engineered green lights in my life, meaning green lights, we love green lights. It, it's, it's, it's a metaphor, it's a traffic light. So through the journey of life, green lights tell us go, proceed, carry on, attaboy, way to go, freedom, more please. We like those. They affirm our way. They're easy. They're like a shoeless summer. 
<laughs> well, we also have red lights and yellow lights, or the yellow lights that we slow down for that, that turn into a red light. We don't usually want those because they do slow us down. They impede our way. They tell us, pause, hang on a second. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interject here. Uh, uh, and, then, and then a red light can be, you know, a, a real crisis, a real hardship, a death, uh, um, a, a health. We don't want any of those. But I found through looking back of 36 years of my life that those red and yellows eventually do turn green or at least have green light assets in them via lessons that we're supposed to learn in the red and yellows that will then turn into green so we can evolve as individuals, as people. Um, so, you know, I, I learned that you can engineer green lights by choices you make today. You can take responsibilities even make sacrifices today that will tee you up and be cool and kind to your future self tomorrow. Let's go to the most simple one. Put the coffee mm -hmm. in the coffee filter the night before you go to bed. So tomorrow morning, all you got to do is get up and go, boop. You know, <laughs> it's sometimes it's hard to make your coffee when you hadn't had your coffee, right? So that's being cool and kind to your future self in a very simple way. Uh, responsibilities we take a preparation for our work in our career. Responsibilities we take as a father, a mother, a husband, a wife, a friend. We can tee ourselves up for more, more, uh, um, more to be thankful for in the future. Um, we can have more quality in our future by choices we make. Now, other times, green lights just fall on our lap. We get lucky. Mm -hmm. An opportunity lands on our lap and there's no reason behind it, but we're like, I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity right now. Um, also, I think the art is really in what do we do sometimes? What do we do with the yellow light? Mm -hmm. So you get to a yellow light, you either slow down mm -hmm. because you run into something in your life where you're like, I need to take pause here. I, I need to have a little introspection here. Now, if I slow down at the yellow light, it's going to turn red. Now I'm going to sit in it and I have to really address this crisis in my life, whatever it is, however big or small. There's great value in that. Or else, how would we grow? If we didn't have the yellows mm -hmm. and reds, how do we grow, right? But I find that sometimes we can be getting a habit of slowing down at yellow lights that we shouldn't even slow down at. We should put the pedal to the metal and blow through them and not even give that crisis credit. Because sometimes we like to slow down at every yellow light and dwell in red lights and sit there and go, oh, I'm a victim here. I need more red lights. I'm wallowing in my misfortune. And it's not healthy for us or constructive for us. So a real art is when do we slow down at a yellow light and go, I need to take some pause here. I need to have a little introspection. And when do we just put the pedal to the metal and say, uh-uh, I ain't giving crisis credit, yellow light. I'm blowing through it. Yeah, it's like tapping those brakes versus, like you said, put the pedal to the metal and fly through. So, And sometimes, like you say, you know, yeah. you just hit all the green lights, and it's just like a happy moment. So you just talked about some of the different chapters and the collection of stories in the book. And there's some that you have some themes like outlaw logic and find your frequency and live your legacy now. So I, 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 people need to read the book because it's all so exciting. But I want to hear a little bit more about the art of running downhill. And can you talk yes. about what that means? And then how do you determine when that's the right approach versus be brave, take the hill? Right. Well, the art of running downhill is something that came to me after I got very successful. And it really happened around uh, the movie we were talking about earlier when Time to Kill came out. Now, I was already an actor, I was already in films, but the Time to Kill is when I became famous, when I became a quote unquote movie star, when all of a sudden I could green light movies mm -hmm. and you'd come to Matthew McConaughey for the lead to movie and studios were coming to me and, and, and my life changed. Um, all of a sudden I had this great affluence. I had all these options that I'd never had before that were all in front of me. Um, hence meaning like the week before A Time to Kill came out, there's a hundred mm -hmm. scripts I would have done anything to do, but they were all, nope, can't do those. Or at least 99 were no, maybe one yes. Now A Time to Kill comes out and over one weekend, the success of A Time to Kill, that inverted. Those hundred scripts I wanted to do, now 99 of them were like, yes, please do ours. And so all of a sudden I'm like, whoa, three days ago, I wanted to do any of these and you wouldn't let me do any of them but one. And now you're telling me I can do 99 out of 100? You want me to be discerning now? You want me to make a choice? Wow. Just three days ago, I would have done any of them. So all of a sudden I've got this influence. I'm going downhill. 
it's e should be easy street, right? Well, I had probably a little bit of an, I think it's called imposter syndrome or non-deserving complex. Why me? Why do I have all these things? Do, am I deserving of this? And when you get that, I know for me, there were times I tripped myself running downhill. I created resistance for myself and face planted, <laughs> you know, and I did it. I imploded trying to like look for more struggle in the ease. Now, I, what I learned is that a lot, some of that wasn't, it was kind of clumsy. It'll happen. I got through it fine. But what I learned is that that probably wasn't a smart thing to do because mm -hmm. I now know that uh, that when you are on easy street, enjoy the wind at your back because, oh, trust the uphill's <laughs> coming anyway. You you don't need to trip yourself when you're running downhill. That uphill's coming. You're going to be going into the wind very shortly. So don't 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 rush it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Now you go to so it's a way of handling success. It's a way of gracefully handle handling it. I had you know the champagne and caviar in my success. Sometimes I felt or made it feel insincere, maybe because I didn't feel like I deserved it. Well, I learned to know, hey, enjoy that because it won't always be champagne and caviar. You know, you, you so we'll, we'll go back and, and then, that helped me enjoy beer and tuna fish sandwiches when it was when that's all I was getting fed. You know what I mean? So uh, that was the running downhill. Now, be brave, take the hill. This is more about, you know, my follow up on, on that title of the part is yeah, be brave, take the hill. But before you take the hill, ask the really important question of what's my hill? That's the really important question. We all want to be relative. So let's ask ourselves before we want relevance, relevant for what? Um, it's, you know, when we can do something that we never were able to do before, ask ourselves, well, do I really want to before I do? Because when we get affluence on us or we get options that we've never had before. I know for me, my instinct is like, well, hell yeah, I want to do it. I mean, it was never an option before. You know, mm -hmm. I tell a story about getting my jeans pressed for the first time by my first housekeeper. And I was like, wow, she presses my jeans. I was telling a friend, isn't that unbelievable? And it's and, and so cool. And my friend goes, yeah, that's cool. If you like your jeans pressed. And I was like, I don't like my jeans pressed, but I loved it because I never had the option before. And so I was thought it was like, say yes to it. So be brave, take the hill. Ask yourself what the hill is. And then yeah. say, that's where, I'm, that's where I'm going. I'm climbing it. It's clear to me. I know that's what I want to be relevant for. I know that's the goal I want to achieve. I know that's where I want to get to. Be brave and take it. Um, but if we spend a little more time defining what our hill is, then we're more mm -hmm. sound in our courage to go our take it. Ah, oh, that's great. You know, I'm going to um, I'm going to shift gears for a minute before our, our friends come and join us, because I do want to ask you about one thing. So something important to us here at LinkedIn is we recognize and share gratitudes. And you know, yes. we often start yes. our team meetings with that. So I start my team meetings and I had one yesterday and we share a gratitude. It could be a professional or a personal. So something really big or even something small. And, and yesterday, I just I just have to give you a couple examples. Yesterday, someone was grateful for being able to take a walk outside. And another person was grateful for shelled pistachios. That, that was amazing. And then- They're better than the non-shelled ones. <laughs> They're easier. And the one person that just reminded me so much of you is she came on and she just, you know, she just said, you know, I'm really grateful for pickles. And we all just looked at her in boss and she's like, no. And she started to describe the four types of pickles and why pickles matter. And then we talked about how you can't say the word pickles without kind of smiling. And so what I wanted to ask you was um, you've introduced gratitude to some of the kids through your Just Keep yeah. Living Foundation. Yeah. So could you tell some folks about the foundation and then again about how gratitude plays sure. a part in that? Sure. 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 So, uh, so we founded uh, the Just Keep Living Foundation about, ten, about years ten, years ago. Ago. 10 years ago. Uh, it's an after school program that's in Title I schools, the, meaning these are schools in lower income areas. Uh, there's quite a few single parent homes, uh, some neighborhoods where it's not the safest place to, to, to go after school to move freely. We give these young men and women a place to come to, to set uh, physical fitness goals which may be, I want to make the soccer team, so i got to get in shape, or it may mean I need to lose three pounds so I can fit in my prom dress. Um, nutrition goals. Hey, 
you know, you spent $35 on, on five burgers and fries last night for dinner. We're going to take you to the supermarket and spend that same $35 on some vegetables, some rice, some beans, maybe a little bit of meat. It'll be healthier for you, and you'll get to go home and cook it together as a family. Um, right. We also have all the children do community service in their community, which gives them ownership. We learned about that because the kids wanted to be, they wanted, they didn't want a free lunch, so to speak. They said, like, no, put me to task. It gave them ownership to say, we tell them you have to give community service in your own community. They love it. And the final halo on the, uh, on the whole uh, curriculum is gratitude. We, at the end of each curriculum, each, each class, everyone sits around in a circle, all the young men and women and teachers, and verbally out loud share something they are thankful for in their life. Well, this, uh, the, one of the neatest things I've heard from the students is they, what they love about the gratitude circles, they would come forward and say, I, for the first time in my life, heard a peer of mine say thank you for something in their life that I have in my life that I've never been thankful for or I took wow. for granted. So there becomes a reciprocity of understanding what to be thankful for. I believe, um, and I'm working on this, defining and, and deconstructing this theory, that actually generosity leads to gratitude. Gratitude leads to responsibility because the more things we're thankful for, the more things we give value to, the more we care for those things. And responsibility for those things will then breed freedom. That's oh, wow. the track I'm working on that I, that, I, that I believe in that's really holding up for me and I still need to work on it. But generosity breeds gratitude. Gratitude breeds responsibility. Responsibility breeds freedom. Um, oh, these, you know, to hear these students talk about gain respect for themselves, gain respect for their mother who holds two jobs and still feeds them and gets them to school, to, to, to have respect for their father or their brother, or to be born into a family where their brothers were all gang members and that's the next thing in line for, this, for them. And to then say, no, I'm going to break the chain because mm -hmm. I'm more thankful for other things in my life that I didn't even notice and are making me see a new path for myself. Uh, yeah, gratitude never really goes out of style. And um, it, uh, it, it can sure help us get out of, get out of a pinch too sometimes. <laughs> it can, that's great. So, hey, I think we have our friends are gonna be joining us. So, uh, hey everyone, are you out there? Are you be able to come on? Everyone. So nice hello, to hello. see you guys. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask you to introduce yourself and also say where you're calling from and then ask Matthew the question. I'll, I'll go ahead and call you out so we can we can go through this. And so first up, it's my friend Lucas. Go ahead, Lucas. Hi, Matthew. I'm Lucas. I'm calling from Idaho. Uh, my question for you today, uh, you mentioned in your book that one of your life goals is to be an egotistical utilitarian. Uh, can you speak more on what you mean by this and give any advice you have to aspiring egotistical utilitarians? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can. Thanks for picking that out. That is, you know, I came up with that term. I wrote a paper on the egotistical utilitarian in college. It was titled John Wayne Goes West. But I, it, it 19 years old, I was already very interested in going like, well, wait a minute. We look at selfish and selfless responsibility and freedom, culture and technology. We look at these things as contradictions, science and God, but they're not. They're, they're actually more of a paradox. So where is that place that what we do for is best for I, the most selfish act, the egotist, egotistical, where are those choices symbiotic with what's best for the most amount of people, the utilitarian? There is a place where the best choice for the I is the best choice for the we. And the best choice for the we is the best choice for the I. I think we have to get a better relationship in our, with our understanding of delayed gratification. Um, if we're always making immediate choices for the I right now, we're not gonna see how that can even help us selfishly in the future or the most amount of people. So if we understand and have a little bit longer view, I think we start to find that place where there's a decision here that may be the most selfless choice which is actually going to pay me back the most, so it's therefore the most selfish choice. There's a decision here where the most selfish choice will actually be the best for the most amount of people. That's the egotistical utilitarian. 
Thank you for the Lucas. I next door. So thanks, Lucas. And uh, next we have Camille. Camille, where are you calling from? And go ahead and ask your question. Hi, I'm uh, calling from Paris in France. So I actually wanted to ask you about your foundation and um, understand how you've uh, adapted the work of your foundation uh, to the new environment. And um, also yeah. ask you, what do you think is the best way to have an impact of, uh, on the future of the teenagers you work with? Heard. Um, so what we did is we got a lot of, uh, a lot of our students didn't have either a laptop or a hotspot to give them the ability to go online and still uh, integrate with our class. So we kept running our after school curriculum. Um, and the students, we got some of them laptops. We got a lot, we found somebody helped us out get hotspots for the students that maybe had a laptop but didn't have a hotspot at home so they could continue with the classes remotely. Um, you know, some of that, we're going to see how much this year do we come out of that and is everyone going to re-engage because it's not clear yet how much everyone's going to completely re-engage physically together. Um, but so we have backup. We didn't really, we didn't fall behind very much actually with class participation and everything, even though the, the students had to do it remotely. Um, now, best way for teenagers, and here we go into the future, I think, you know, I'm, I try to approach teenagers in, in, in a very realist fashion. I'm not really someone who goes like, hey, if you dream it, you can do it. No, I'm all for dreams, but I'm all for, I know that it takes a lot of hard work. And if we're, I try to say this to people, especially teenagers, look, what are you good at? What do you naturally have an innate ability that you're good at? And they'll, if they can come up with that, then go, and I bet you like doing that because you're good at it. And they go, yeah, I do. It feels good because I'm actually good at it. Okay. And I say, now, is there a way that what you're good at and what you're willing to work for, what you're willing to get educated for, what you're willing to chase down, that you also have an innate ability to do. Is there a way that what you can supply could be in demand in the world? Meaning, could you make a living with it? Can it be more than a hobby? Can you make, can it be a, a, a capitalist career? Can it be a job that you pursue? That would be the ideal spot. Now, everyone's not able to do what we love to do all the time. If everyone only did what we love to do, we'd have really high un unemployment. <laughs> so sometimes we just got to go to work and go, I, you know what, this is what I do. It pays my bills. It takes care of me. It takes care of my family. But if we can, uh, to, to the youth, I try to say, well, don't complicate it right now. What do you love to do? Now, can that, can, are you willing to work for that and look forward and say, is there a way that what I'd love to do and what I'm willing to work for can be something that someone in the world may demand where I could make a living off of it. Um, that's the ideal spot. And also I tell them, tell the youth this, don't pressure yourself so much on knowing exactly what you think you need to do in life. Process of elimination first, get rid of the things that you know you're not. Get rid of those things, those friends and places and th habits you may have that do not feed you, that, are, that, that do not feel, make you feel like tomorrow when you wake up, you groan. Get rid of those things. Don't put so much pressure on yourself of knowing, I've got to know what I need to do. I've got to know what my future is. Damn, I didn't know what I needed, what I, what I wanted to do. I, yeah. I, kind of, I kind of fell into it at 21 and still yeah. figuring out who the, what it is I want to do in life at 51. So, the, and, and then I'll, I'll follow up on the one last thing on that. When you're not sure what to do and you are in a position where you have an A or B choice about do I take this path or that path, Sometimes it doesn't even matter which choice you make. Just make one and commit to it. You'll find out if it was the right or wrong one. Or if you just commit to it, you may put yourself in a position to find something that finds you and you go, oh, this is what I want to do. Or you may find your, find your path by making the choice. But too often, I believe, we sit in limbo and go, well, I don't know if I want to do that. I don't know if I want to do that. Don't know if I want to do that. Don't know if I want to do that. And all of a sudden, we look up and years have passed and we're still sitting there going, I'm not sure which one I want to do. So sometimes it's just like, make a choice and go for it. It will reveal itself to you what it is you want to do or something will find you. I think that was some of the best advice I read in your book. And I, I have a son graduating college and uh, the, the, uh, the thought of, what don't you want to do? Get clear on that. And I, I just thought that was terrific yeah. advice. 
Camille, thanks for staying up with us. We're so glad to have you join us. And let's move over to Jenna. Jenna, go ahead and introduce yourself, where you're calling from, and your question for Matthew. Hi, Matthew. Uh, so I'm from Santa Barbara, and um, I had a question. You've had a very successful career, and you are a household name. How do you balance that version of your identity with the normal human father, husband, Matthew? Yeah. You know, in some ways, I have to wear a different hat, meaning who I am and then when I step out into the world of how the world sees me. But I've always, and I think this is part, some way part, I think if I'm going to add up in any way that I have been successful um, and why, um, and maybe in whatever, to whatever extent, um, leading a healthy life and have a healthy family and stuff. And how are those two working? Because they're hard to balance sometimes. I've always wanted to close that gap between who I'm perceived to be and who I am for my public persona and who I actually am. I, um, it's part of the reason I wrote the book. It's part of one of the outcomes of writing the book. The, the writing the book was a lot of freedom for me. I mean, boy, I, I, I you know, it's not a tell all book, but I'm, brutally honest and some people say quite vulnerable in the book well that closes that gap between i'm like i there's not a question you can ask me <laughs> that i that, that i'm going to be embarrassed about or go oh you don't ask me that question hell read the book i'm, I'm bringing up stuff that people are like i can't believe you said that i'm like well yeah it really happened and it's part of life um so you know it's 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 a mix between who i am and who i was long before i was famous is part of why I became maybe famous and successful, but it's also vice versa. Well, now who I am, now that I have access, now that I have affluence, I'm successful, as you said, a household name. That, you know, how does that define who I am in real life when I'm at home and the cameras aren't on? Um, you know, I, I uh, um, like with our kids, you know, raising our kids, they I, they need to under, they understand who their, their mom and dad are. They not understand what we do and should not be ashamed of that but understand that they're not defined by that i know i'm not defined by my fame I, my kids understand or understanding are understanding that they're not defined by whatever affluence they have as mine and camilla's sons and daughters that they're not defined by their dad's a celebrity that they don't live in a nice house solely because their dad was a celebrity so to speak we talk a lot about values well who are you what's the character you have along the way and don't jeopardize that on the way to whatever it is you're chasing in life um so i think hopefully that answers your question um i've always i've always you know i haven't always been perfect at it but I've always tried to be the, the most true to myself and whatever i was chasing to achieve i've always tried to not sell my soul on the way to achieving whatever it is mm -hmm. i could achieve um and um yeah yeah Try to fill the soul's right. account and the bank account. You can fill both at the same time. It's another one. You know what I mean? I like that in the book when you wrote about that. So, Jenna, thanks. That was a great question. I appreciate that. Um, and just you. before we go on to the next person, Matthew, um, someone just posted in the chat. They just donated to Just Keep Living Foundation. So, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciating the, appreciating the work that you and your team is doing over there. So next up, we have Brian. Brian, where are you calling from? You can introduce yourself and ask Matthew your question. Hi, Matthew. Brian calling from Oakland, CA. Um, you're a great storyteller. I mean, whether you're talking about taking a sip of a you know hundred year old bourbon or uh, lulling <laughs> me to sleep uh, on the call map, um, you know you, you can spin a tale as well as anyone. What do you think is the the key or the secret to telling a great story? All right. Great question. Great question. Um, you know, one. It's a few things. One, it is know your audience, meaning if I'm going to tell the same story, if I'm going to pitch a, pitch, pitch a film, say True Detective, my son, who's 10, says, so what's it about? I'm going to pitch it differently to him than I'm going to pitch it to my wife or I'm going to pitch it to you or I'm going to pitch it to a studio head. You've got to know who your audience is, right? Sometimes with the kids, I'll go to put it in parable form. You know, where they can understand it and get the themes of good and bad and good, overcoming evil, et cetera, um, and put it in a mythic sort of parable form. Because if I'm, 
it's some R-rated NC-17 material. I can't go into all the details. Right now, to my wife, she's old enough to handle it. We can, I can pitch it to her straight out, and I tell the story in a different way. But when you tell your story and you know your audience, it's telling it like you like I'm not telling it to an audience. I'm telling it to me, I'm, I'm, I, or, or at least maybe only just you. I, like it's to one person in particular, and even if there's 10 million listening, um, it's to, that keeps the storyteller in the subjective. That keeps me on the right timing where I don't, because what happens in stories or, you know, there's a good joke teller. A good joke teller, what's, the, what's their real talent? The real talent of a good joke teller is trusting that pause before the punchline. People, you tell a great joke, you're at a dinner table, you can tell it's going well, but you get to the end and everyone, you got everyone hanging on every word and you get to the end and you know it's the time to give the real big pause before the punchline, but the silence makes you nervous and you get anxious and everyone's looking and you speed it up and it, oh, you lost the punch. If you just would have let it sit and let the pregnant pause sit there, then that punchline would have really been a home run. So it's patience. Um, it's certain amount of details, but hopefully not too many details for people to get lost in the in, in the woods of your story. And it's timing and trusting pauses. That's good. That's really good. Hey, Brian, thanks for your question. And I also have to say that I have many times listened to the Calm app and your story of wonder. I have never heard the ending once ever. Uh, so that means it's working. It's really good. good job there. <laughs> Okay, so last up, we've got Becca. Becca, where are you calling from? And go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Matthew. I'm calling in from our Dublin office. And I think it's safe to say that 2020 was more of a red light kind of year. And for me, similar to what you said at the beginning, I was able to catch a relatively decent number of green lights. But I was wondering for you, kind of personally, in 2020, what was your greenest light or maybe a red light turned green? Sure. Well, it was, you know, let me, let me say this. There were a lot of, I had a, I put my first book out, this book out. I had a plan for a personal tour. I was going to go around the world and go to theaters and tell stories. And have book buys, and 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 that was the plan. I was gonna do it many months. Well, COVID comes, I couldn't do that. Ah, geez, oh man, COVID's here. You're gonna put your book out in in in, in an election year in America. You're gonna get many people said your 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 book's gonna get swarmed. It's never gonna get seen. It's gonna there's too much going on. Uh, people aren't gonna read the books. The election's gonna take over. We got COVID. We got civil unrest. We said, I said. Well, let's lean into that. Maybe this book can be some some good news in the time of a lot of bad news. And then we start these different calls like this. And instead of being there in person around the world, which would have taken much more time, I the other morning, for instance, am and on an hour call telling stories like this in Italy at 9 a.m. I'm in the UK at 10 a.m. doing the same thing. I'm in New York City at 11 a.m. doing the same thing. I'm in L.A. at noon doing the same thing. And I'm finished with the L.A. call at 12.59. And at 1 p.m., I'm having lunch live with my family in person. I wouldn't have been able to do that. I could have been in all those places. Those people couldn't have been in all those places. I looked at that going, oh, wow, technology's pretty cool that way. I was able, it wasn't completely like being in person, but damn, it's pretty close. And I think we had a very similar experience as we would have had in person. I then say things like, wow, look at all the carbon footprint we didn't leave. Look at all the places. I was a magic type of time travel. There are, so I'm leaning into now and it's saying, okay, how much is this our new normal? And how much is that okay? I mean, we all say, oh, we want to get back and go back how it used to be. I don't believe there is go back to how it used to be. I think there is a new normal. We will re-engage again. There's nothing that's going to take place of the human touch, the hug, the in-person uh, experience that we have with people that we cherish. But, boy, this is pretty good. And it's given, in a lot of ways, can give some people 
time to deal with what they really value in life. Like I was saying, that one o'clock lunch with your family that maybe they wouldn't have had time to do before. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about, you know, one, the future of work, the future of communication uh, in our jobs, which can allow time for us to spend more time, maybe with what we really value in life, as I'm saying, the family lunch. Um, I'm excited about where are we going to go and we have to rebuild as people, as, as our nation that I live in, other nations. We're, we have to buy, rebind our social contracts again. We've, we're coming out of a time of great distrust. Don't know who to believe in, what to believe in. Don't know who to trust, what to trust. We start seeing the world that way. We start to distrust ourselves. We start to not believe in ourselves. And that becomes a, a downhill path, a slippery slope that I don't think we want to go down too steep. So now we have this chance to go, okay, let's rebuild our social contracts again. Let's re we, 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 we had it forced upon us to say, to reevaluate our lives. This whole last year, whether we knew it or not, we were forced to be stripped down to certain necessities. We were forced to look inward. We were forced to get bored because we couldn't go do what we wanted to do. We were forced to, you know, we ended up, I say this, and it, boy, I petted the, the pets are sure getting, I'm petting the pets a lot longer this year <laughs> because, you know what I mean? Spending more time with my family, having more family dinners. Um, my, my, my mother who's 89, got to spend every day of the last 10 months with her grandchildren. That would have, We would have never done that until we, our hand was forced to do that. So those are a lot of green light assets that, I've, that I believe came out of this year for me personally. And I think we've all got them to different levels. As I said very early on, and you, just, you brought it up for me, relatively I'm doing well. There are a lot of people that could listen to what I'm saying right now and going, easy for you to say, but Connie, I lost my job. Or mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm still trying to find a job. Um, I went through a divorce. Me and my family were on top of each other and we couldn't stand each other. There are people out there that are, that are going through that. I understand that as a, as, a, as a reality. I do think at the same time to look at the things that we can be, to go back to gratitude, thankful for in our life, to say, hey, how, how do I, have I given more value to things that maybe I should have given more value to that I wasn't before? How has this forced me to see and give more value to things uh, in my life that I should? Um, and can I continue to value those things to the extent that I am now when I have the freedom to go out again, to go out and move across the world freely like maybe I used to? And I, hopefully we can hang on to some of those things and remember those, what we, what we learned to value in this time, that we were forced to learn to value, that we can take those out when we have the freedom that we're not forced to have to be stuck with them as long as we were in this last year. Uh, gr great question, Becca, because you hit on so many things. It's really just all the silver linings that we've experienced. And that's part of what our Lift Up initiative is, is that we do know that this is difficult times. It, personally, maybe we're worried about a loved one. Uh, maybe we're yeah. home alone and we're feeling isolated, but there is so much also to be thankful for. And so, Becca, that was a great question. I want to thank all of you guys, my friends out there, for joining me and helping me out today. So I'm going to catch up with all you guys later. Um and I do have to say, it's probably yeah, been the you. best year of my questions. dog's life. Yeah. Of yeah. your dog's life, right? <laughs> best year of my dog's life, for sure. She's probably like, this is amazing. Okay, so <laughs> last question. I got to ask you, you know, um, you're only about halfway through this life. And there's, there's a lot of people out there that hit their 50s, and they start thinking about you know, how are they going to like slow down in the future when, when really, you know, you, if you look back on the 30 years and everything you've accomplished in the last 30 years, you have at least another 30 years ahead of you, if not more. So my question for you is a little bit two part. What's ahead for you? And then also in this minister of culture role, are you ever considering leading something like that's out, that outside of Austin, perhaps for all of Texas or the U S and and is there still a dream job out there that perhaps is a larger platform than even you are on now? Maybe. I mean, it's what I'm considering now. How can I, again, what do what maybe I have an innate ability to do? The Minister of Culture work that I'm doing and that I'm planning and trying to work out what, what's my best way to be effective with it, moving forward into the, the future, that stuff I naturally think of that's what wakes me up at 2 a.m. in the morning 
how people, the values people have, how people get along, cool transactions, mm -hmm. people having something to look forward to, uh, um, you know, civility that we've lost, that are, that, are, that, are, that are basic understandings and principles that we can all agree on that have, even if we disagree on where, we're going to, where we go to church and disagree on who we voted on. Um, so it's, it's outside of politics. It's much more human. It's outside of religion. It's much more just on the, on the human level. So it's a, it's a place of accepting many differences, but having a common denominator of values that we can all agree on. And again, that goes back to what I was saying earlier, buying social contracts with each other and with ourselves. Redefine the expectations. I have a view as a person, as a citizen, as a friend, I, I, as, as, as a, it, all these things. And redefine that social contract with what I expect of myself and vice versa. Now, the values campaign and competent values, I believe we all can become more competent, better at our values. Mm -hmm. And that will help create and define our collective purpose. But it starts with the individual. I don't know how to give, make policy out there to make a change amongst people. I do have a hunch that I've got some inside scoop on how to go challenge the individual who's looking themselves in the mirror to go, how can I be a little bit better today? How can I make the choice that as the question that came up earlier is the egotistical utilitarian choice? What's good for me? Yeah, because it all has to be personal. A lot of times we say, no, we shouldn't be selfish. I disagree with that. Now, mind you, I understand I'm redefining the word selfish in a different way. But there's a place where we, I think I don't think any of us do anything or make real change without it being very personal. Mm -hmm. We intellectualize things all the time. But, yeah, that's a great idea. I agree with that platitude. But, boy, unless it's personal, we really don't take action. So I think it needs to be deeply personal. And that's why I say I think it needs to be selfish. But when we understand that the deeply personal choice and, and it is not just for the moment, but for us tomorrow and 10 years down the road. And 20 years down the road for the next generation, for our children, those are mm. there's more selfishness in the best choices for those. When we project out, I think we just need to project further out about what we're deeming. When are we gratified and who is getting gratified? Who's winning? You know what I mean? When we when we do something for our daughters or our sons to create a world that's going to be better for them, I would call that a very selfish act, even though we may not be getting ours today. They're going to get more. They have more of a chance and equal opportunity to get theirs tomorrow. I would call that a selfish act, even though it's a selfless act, maybe. So the Ministry of Culture work is something that, yeah, I want to I think Austin's probably going to be my Petri dish, meaning my experiment. It's a social experiment. And if I want to go into Austin, very organized. But the values I'm talking about are not only owned by one city. They could scale out across any town, city, state, country, worldwide. And what I'm doing is I'm on a constant listening tour. I'm interviewing people all the time. I've traveled the world. I've written down values that I've seen from tribes in Africa to, 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 to the, the office in the top of the tower in Dubai, trying to find these common denominator values that we can all go, yes, I agree on that. I'll shake on that. I'll purchase that. I'll pledge to that. Spread those again. Get those moving around, and it could be it could be global, um, but I need to start, I believe, in my backyard first, um, and see if I can get individuals and companies and institutions aligned on a collective understanding and agreement of what our so said values are that will give us all more quality in life going forward. Um, Again, where do we fill our souls account? Where do we fill our bank account? Where do we have gross national product? Where, where do we also have gross national happiness? Um, there's a way, I think, to fill all those accounts and for us to get blue ribbons in both. Um, so long answer to, yes, I'm looking at leadership positions in the future um, and trying to figure out well, how can I be most useful and where am I most useful? I don't want to go where I'm not most useful and I'm not interested in putting a bunch of Band-Aids on things. That's why you know, um, I've thought about politics, but boy, right now, I, I, until I see, understand the purpose of politics and understand that it's not, it's, it can be more than just putting band-aids on situations that are going to be ripped off four years later. When I understand it could be more than that, then that may be something I'd be more interested in, but I'm still defining what my future is. And finally, what's in the future? I want to custom, I keep customizing the things that I've already gotten. It's not always about, I think at say 50 years old about what are my new goals? It's about looking at, well, what I've already built, family, fatherhood, 
how can my how can those roots grow wider and deeper in the future so it's tending the gardens of the things I've already built or some of my goals in the, in the future is just to keep tending the gardens of, of some of the goals I've already I'm already working on right now well thank you for everything that you're doing to make this world better i look forward to what you'll do in the future uh also you know mass congrats on the book it's amazing thank you. there's so much we didn't get to i had a million other questions i just want to say thank you so much for joining us today i know our listeners were thrilled this is a personal thrill for me to have talked with you because i read the book and it, it meant a lot to me so everyone just please thank join you. me in a virtual round of applause for matthew and all of you uh, on the call, I, you know, I want to thank you. Uh, we'll look to see you guys again at our next LinkedIn uh, speaker series. And in the meantime, I just want you, if you have a moment, make an effort to lift up someone else's spirits because we all know that a kind word can go a long way. So take care and enjoy the rest of your end day. And Matthew, again, thank you so much for being with us. Mm -hmm.